Hello there, everybody. Welcome to the LJL Officially Unofficial, where we are bringing you live coverage of the LJL in English. We're here with Match Day 14. My name is Middlecourt. Going to be joined by Infinite Dodge. Apparently, my name is English Language Coverage and Content for the <laughs> LJL today, which, uh, you know what? That's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, yeah, it doesn't really um... roll off the tongue. <laughs> no, no, not not exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a, uh, a different setup today, as we are just the two of us here making making do, but it's going to be a banger match day nonetheless. Starting off with DFM versus Burning Core should be a great, great game. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a really fun matchup to start with, because obviously we've had DFM be this kind of second place team uh, throughout the, the split in terms of the LGL, but after taking down Sengoku in their recent matchup and with Sengoku falling to the Hawks as well, it is DFM who have got that sole claim over first place, as we've seen from them so many times before in the past. And Burning Core still trying to get their season online, really, like a lot of the teams in the league. Yeah, very much so. And I think uh, it's sort of the inevitability that people speak about with the LJL when it comes to Detonation Focus Me being at our top of the table here, Sengaku leading the pack for a while. But a pretty shocking loss yesterday to the Hawks. And that does uh, really bandy up these standings here near the top three. The Hawks still trying to make a run uh, before DFM and Sengaku lock those juggernaut match spots. So lots of big games today in terms mm. of standings. Things. Burning Core as well, only a game behind RJ, so they're really hoping for an upset here against DFM. Should be a lot of really interesting matches on the docket. But yeah, definitely uh, yeah. more of what we expect at the DFM up top. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And one of those teams that is actually sort of tied with Burning Core right now is Crest Gaming Act, who are going to be playing off against the Hawks. Obviously, that is going to have massive standing implications with, like you mentioned, the Hawks trying to push themselves into those juggernaut places spot and Honestly, for Crest Gaming Act, I think the mission now is just trying to get into playoffs and stave off a potential threat from Axis coming from below. Yeah, uh, Axis, we spoke about it on the desk on Friday, sort of looking like more of the sum of their parts, uh, in my opinion. Random minion caster thinking they're just generally underrated and that uh, they, uh, you know, they still do have a shot here. They're only one game out of that sixth and final playoff spot. CGA going to have to play for their lives here, and it, it might be a little bit tough going up against uh, Soft Bangkok's in game number two. Yeah, uh, they've been looking. Uh, they've been looking pretty, uh, pretty strong actually so far. Finally, the team that we expected to be coming in super hot in spring has arrived in, in summer a little bit late. But when uh, I, I think that the aims of this roster should be making a deep run into playoffs and maybe sneaking some uh, snipes up against the top two teams in the league, maybe a shot at Worlds isn't completely out of the question. Obviously, still a lot of games to go. But Dodge, I kind of want to focus in on our first matchup of the day. Detonation, focus me versus Burning Core. Now, I, I think that if you look at these rosters on paper, ignoring the bottom side, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. These are two teams that should be fairly evenly matched in terms of like pure skill, but DFM have just shown the ability to constantly be one step ahead of, of what Burning Core could throw out. Yeah, I think DFM have a bit of an advantage here in that they are very much capable of playing as a five-man unit in some ways that Burning Core doesn't always seem to gel with. Flawless in particular can uh, make some interesting decisions in the jungle, uh, be a little bit over-aggressive at times uh, in ways that his team can't really support. Uh, but in terms of soul laners, I think DICE uh, you know, does fit in nicely into Yaharong. Ebby, of course, always constantly great up in the top lane, but Ray Farkey has shown some big carry pop-off potential as well with the likes of the Darius, these melee fighters. Yeah. So uh, I, I think the, the matchup spread is is not ludicrously unfavored for Burn and Core. I think they definitely do have a shot here. But then Dodge, bot lane. <laughs> well, that that's sort of the <laughs> elephant in the room, isn't it? The, the, uh, it, it really, really is. Because like, obviously, like... I think that for Yuhi and Loser, I think they've been performing at a higher level than we would have expected. But I think that's still a few a few tier two uh, tiers below the the likes of Utapon uh, and the likes of, of Harp, who have just been like incredible throughout this summer split. Yeah, very much so. I mean, Yuhi has has stepped it up since coming back into the eighty carrier role. We've sort of 
you know, been the whipping boy of the LJL for a couple of splits now. We've we've really liked to rag on Yuhi for some low level eighty carry play, but I, I think dress code has sort of come and assumed that role for us now in, in more recent days. And I, I think Yuhi's been serviceable. Obviously there was the role swap to support at the beginning of the split. It didn't work out very well for anybody involved. Oh, but yeah. Always reliable on the Aphelios, right? Can play some of these other late game scaling carries, none too shabbily. And I don't know. It's 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 such a roll of the dice, pardon the pun, trying to beat detonation focus I me mean, no matter who you are. I think you just have to throw caution to the wind, try and get your comfort bot lane and, and hope it doesn't affect the, the matchup spread across uh across the game too much yeah. there. Uh, and I, I think throwing caution to the wind is kind of just what goes into Flawless's head when he loads into any game. Um, you, you talked about some of the maybe more suspect jungle pathing, but we have also seen creativity from him actually work out. Like there was the starting on the red buff on top side, flashing over Baron Pitwall to invade uh, Kassin uh, in the CJ matchup. They did end up losing, but he was able to generate such a lead on himself or on the Trundle in the jungle versus the Jin Zhao that... But for a lot of time, it did look like Burning Call were actually going to take the W in that game. But zooming out a little bit more to, to the compositions that, that both these teams build. DFM love to get things going in the early game. That doesn't mean they always pick like champions that are super hyper-aggressive in the early game. Sometimes they just make it work when they get a little bit uh, little bit into the mid side. But, but for Burning Call, it does feel like the Flawless really has been the early game player for them. And the rest of the time, they are drafting a bit more scaling in their lanes, which I think could be risky going up against DFM. Yeah, and I think it's a trap we see a lot of teams in the LJL fall into, right? This default back onto scaling, this sort of slow and steady wins the race, wait for your opponent to make a mistake to punish. And that doesn't work when you're playing against not only one of the most coordinated teams in the region, if not the most, but mm. five exceptionally talented mechanical players. There aren't going to be the same amount of mistakes to punish. And we've sort of seen it be the scuttlebutt for so many teams trying to play against DFM. I think trying to create a chaotic game state, which, as you've already said, Flawless can excel at is probably your best bet, but then you do also have the angle where DFM can pick something like a poppy in the jungle for steel and make it look like a Lee Sin. So that they're not afraid to scrap either. So it, it's definitely it's an uphill battle, uh, no matter what here from Burning Core. But get weird with it, get wacky with it, pick some hyper aggressive stuff, play some invades as we do get into draft and uh, get to get a look at what it is they will be cooking up for us. Yeah, let's go. DFM batting away the Silas. And the Callista. Callista, 100% ban on 12.13 in the LGL. We've had two game days so far where it was completely taken off the board. And we are starting day 14 with no Spear of Vengeance in the bot lane. Burning Court as well, putting their focus towards that bottom half of the map, banning away the Lucian and this Yumi to try and dissuade his very first pick. Yeah, definitely so. Also going to be the Silas takeaway on the very first ban there for Detonation Focus Me. That to me uh, signals that it's going to be a Gnar angle, and why not? Ebby, the OG Gnar, <laughs> so good in the meta right now uh, with that more carry-oriented build, Triforce into Black Cleaver, such team fighting potential. And what's really interesting to me here, Middlecott, uh, I love when this happens. Alistar priority in major regions the past couple of days has really gone up in terms of picks and bans. Because it got buffed on 12.14, which we're not playing on yet, but I think they're sort of reminded of how good it is, but that will be the first pick, uh, Zeri, coming on through for DFM. They don't want to let that one go over. Yeah. I mean, you don't have, like, the Yumi, obviously, to, to buff you up, but you can go towards a few of these more tank supports, stuff like the, the Nautilus, maybe like Leona. Obviously, Alistair is, is off the table, but DFM haven't really uh, inched their draft too much with this first pick, and now... Burning Core are going to respond. Actually, taking away that Nautilus may be a good idea because the thing about Zeri is that she is so mobile, but a point and click ultimate knocking her up means the engage is so much easier. Yeah, absolutely so. And that's kind of why we saw Nautilus come back into the meta, right? It was such a potent uh, counter pick into the Zeri specifically because of that point and click. But middle cot, we oh, wanted oh, action. Oh. We wanted spice. They locked in the Draven here for Yuhi along with the Nautilus. This is going to be a bloody, bloody bot lane if Burning Core has anything to say about it. Okay, so uh, I think the last Draven game I saw was actually Exekick in the LFL playing for LDLC up against Carmine Corp. The thing about this Draven is that he is so punishing into lanes that can't fight him early. And spoiler alert, 
There aren't any lanes that can fight him early. I'm a little bit concerned that it's Yuhi piloting this one. We, we do know that he has tendencies to not maybe get the most out of champions that he could do, but the matchup's good. The skill level uh, maybe doesn't matter as much as the FM going towards this Wukong and the Ari, super, super standard. Yeah, very much so. I mean, this Wukong has been a consistent paragon of the jungle here ever since the changes coming through uh, with that W being able to hop walls now, that Warrior Trickster, but that is a Morgana lock-in. This what could the? be the counter pick here in the mid lane uh, to the Ari. This could be a jungle flex pick. This is some really exciting stuff I did not expect from Burning Core here. Yeah, Dodger, neither of us were actually scheduled uh, to cast this morning, but I'm quite glad that things have turned out the way they have because Burning Core going up against the top team of the region, they're going, we're not going to play standard. We're not going to play something that we know you know how to beat. We're going to throw these curveballs. We're going to try and make you slip up, which is what we were talking about in the pregame. Yeah, it's absolutely wonderful to see. I think this heralds such a change in attitude that is so, so healthy for this region to see these teams bet it all on these big playmaking characters to just play a little bit fast and loose and, and really more explosive. I mean, even Detonation Focus, me picking up this Ari early is always an exciting one to see. So definitely one of the more interesting drafts I've seen out of the LJL in recent weeks. Definitely excited to see how this one does wind up going. Uh, of course, now it's time for me to go back over to the sort of cynical viewpoint as we see some of these support <laughs> bands coming out. That doesn't necessarily mean Burning Core's chances of winning are any higher, yeah. but you know what? We'll have a much more entertaining game on our hands. I, I think the idea is you've already got this Draven Nautilus. You just want to double down uh, on this bot lane. You want to secure as good a matchup for yourselves as possible and remove as many tools away from Harp, from DFM as that <laughs> is an Irelia. We're not stopping. We're not stopping. <laughs> In front of, we're just Farky. getting crazy drafts. Ray Farky is daring Ebby to pick the Gnar. And you know what? Ebby is the kind of person who might just accept that challenge as now the Braum Hover coming through. Good counter engage peel. Those hooks come in. You put up the shield. You start applying that Winter's Bite passive. Uh, sort of like the Tarek, very good into other mm. engaging supports that want to come into you. Can block some of these big spinny axes from Yuhi as well. So I think a, a solid pick here to, to try and bring some protection to Utapon down in that bot lane. Hey, hey, there, there's no one better at keeping the rest of your team safe than Braum. Like, just in, in terms of kit, but also just in terms of dynamic. Such a lovely stand guy. Stand behind him. Yeah, stand oh. behind Braum. Do it. Truly, Do truly it, like the, the most wholesome chat in the world. Locking in a Nart when an Irelia is already on the enemy team is a <laughs> bold <laughs> call from DFM. Oh. So many people have been bodied in the Nart versus Irelia matchup. This is such a classic counter pick for Burning Core. They may be switching up saying this Irelia isn't going top lane. We're going to get the Sejuani and have Dice play Irelia into this Ari. Yeah, I mean, the flex potential is really off the charts right now if the Sejuani does get locked in. Technically, it could be Sejuani wait, jungle, wait, wait, yeah, Morgana yeah. jungle. Uh, it's it's Ooh. it's really uh, going to be up to these swaps here to, to clear things up because there, there are a lot of angles. And you know what? Burning Core, not to say that using flexes is a dirty trick. It's not. It's, it's a <laughs> fair... Uh, you know, angle to approach a draft from, but you need every little bit of trickery and deceit up your sleeves that you have when you're playing against the top team in the region. So go ahead, create obfuscation, create confusion, uh, create panic amongst the opposing ranks. Mm. And it does look like it might be that Morgana jungle. We are waiting yeah. for these last few seconds to come through. Yeah. Oh man, okay. look at that. Okay, yeah, so if, if you don't know, 20 seconds is the lock. So yeah. beyond 20, 20 seconds, you can't change champions anymore. It's just to make sure that everyone is able to lock in the correct summoner spells as a response to what they're going to be laning up against. But holy moly, Dodge. <laughs> That's an understatement. Uh, yeah, I... The Morgana jungle, I think, has been making a bit of a comeback recently. I do yeah. think we saw it played once already, this split. So it sort of exists as, as this... Uh, not quite as strong as it was at MSI 2021, but still this very fast clearing utility jungler can offer big AOE CC with the ultimate in the team fights and will just rack up XP in a world where junglers uh, keeping pace with the solo laners isn't really as common of a thing anymore. So definitely a, a nice little pickup here for Burning Core. 
and, and I think the weird thing about the Morgana is that she was like slightly nerfed after after sort of like the, that MSI that you mentioned, but her numbers were never completely taken out of relevance. She's been a fine jungler for all this time. It's just teams haven't really been willing to to pick her up because well, if you're picking up a Morgana jungle out of metal, like what the hell are you doing? But we'll have to see if Burning Court can make it work as we are on to the rift for game one of the day. DFM taking on BC. Five stacks from DFM in this bot side. A little bit more spread out from Burning Core. Yeah, and thankfully Loser did get in there and get that ward down without getting found out and jumped on. Does get swept away, so be a nice little bit of XP and gold into somebody's pocket there. But you know what? You take it when you don't die. That's the most important thing. You don't want to be giving Azari any early cushion. You want to punish that champion while it's weak. Don't let it get ahead of the curve, because once it reaches its two, three item spikes, it will be absolutely impossible to deal with. And one element here, Middle Cot, uh, mm -hmm. that immediately jumps out to me is Flawless has taken the Dark Harvest okay. here on the Morgana jungle. So okay. not just like... the full clearing angle, the big bursty angle. <laughs> well, I mean, I think Mor Morgana does actually do a lot more damage than I think people necessarily expect because she's been built as uh, a support for, for so long in seasons prior in the jungle, obviously, where the, the income is maybe a little bit more limited. People underestimate how much damage a Dark Binding and a Tormented Soil can do, but if you're itemizing pretty aggressively, it can just completely shred health files. Obviously, now, with that W, the Tormented Soil, you can do the blue buff and the Grumpers once as Actually, still doing a, a little yeah. bit of a cheeky aggression towards the bottom side of the map. Loser does have the Vash available, but isn't going to burn it. First blood for you to pot. Yeah, and that's just pure cojones coming through from Steel. <laughs> Knows that that uh, gank possibility is open there, and that, uh, you know, with the Glacial Augment instead of the Aftershock, Loser going to be so much less tanky. You come through with that Warrior Trickster, and you just find the angle to beat down on the support. And now that's so much of the early pressure of this Draven Nautilus lane neutralized, and it really gives such a window for Utapon and Harp to secure a successful and uh, fruitful lane state for themselves. But we see some more. More trading coming through in the mid lane. Yeah, fair play to Yaharong. He's been uh, one of our uh, stronger mid laners uh, so far this split and so far this year. Doesn't really like dying. Only done that a few times so far this split. And uh, dies a player that I think maybe dies a, a little bit too much for his own good. Is definitely a playmaker for Burning Core in the best of times, but in the worst of times, a little bit of a liability. Yeah, and that can only get accentuated by a champion like Aurelia, right? Yeah, almost have this this tick when it comes to Aurelia players where I gotta cue the wave, I gotta <laughs> cue the wave, I gotta jump forward, I gotta be mechanical. And when you're on that sort of edge of your seat, high anxiety state, it can definitely be possible to make a misplay into the likes of Yaharong on this explosive AP assassin. So keep our eyes on mid lane as things continue forward. But it is now flawless, essentially finished with the full clear could mm. go for a bottom crab here to round it off, but this is the power that Morgana has up two camps on Steel's Wukong right now. Yeah, and the, the onus really is going to be on Utapon to sort of make that kill work for him, because early kills on AD carries are good, but it's only going to get you to your spikes further. Like, Utapon isn't so much stronger than Yuhi right now, as we see a hook coming through from Loser in the bot lane, and Flawless getting a little bit of vision in the enemy jungler significant trade in the mid lane from dice here is going to be able to uh, sustain up actually both of these mid laners have a reasonable amount of sustain and flawless now potentially anticipating a gank to come through from steel is a level up on the wukong secures the dark binding and the tormented soil but the damage isn't quite there at this stage of the game dice getting the flawless you wait onto yaharong may have actually baited himself in but the wukong doesn't want to dive forward yeah, definitely not. Nice little block coming through with that clone. Otherwise, it might have been a bit of a scary situation for Steel. But Flawless and Dice really just playing for the wave state. They had the level advantage to begin that little stare off that did occur Ooh. as Steel forced a flash there. I mean, it's, it's oh. still getting held by Yaharong there. He's being a real nuisance to this mid jungle. They have to commit. But with that flash gone from Steel, pretty easy for them to get that wave finally shoved. Yeah, and the amount of time that Flawless has spent around this mid lane Maybe a little bit suspect, but one of the things about the Morgana is that she does clear incredibly quickly, obviously putting a few points into that W early. Probably going to outpace this Wukong and really start to build up that CS lead again. 
Yeah, definitely so. And what's really great about this Morgana is look at that refillable potion sitting in her inventory. Hasn't touched a stack on it, beginning her second full clear now, starting with this Gromp without having backed once. The sustain is so crazy in that jungle. You can go for a, a very rich back here and pick up a large amount of impact uh, with the AP you'll be able to invest into. So whether they wait until this first Herald to start duking it out or they're once again inspired by the changes on 1214 to start prioritizing these early dragons a little bit more, Flawless hmm. definitely going to be packing a wallop once they get there. Ooh, good dodge away from Yaharong there. And yeah, I'm interested as well into what Flawless is actually going to be itemizing as uh, Ebby gets a, a decent chunk onto Ray Farky in the top side, but no Ignite on the Nar, you don't really have the kill pressure because Morgana is a champion. We spoke about how she saw a lot of play as a support, but can be relevant in terms of a damage carry. You've already got a fair bit of damage in terms of this Draven, in terms of this Irelia as well. Maybe you're lacking a bit of uh, magic damage. Maybe this that is... can come from this Morgana, or maybe she goes for something a little bit more supportive like an Imperial Mandate. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see, right? Because Flawless opted towards this very aggressive rune setup with the Dark Harvest, and it looked a little bit scary there for a second, like Steel and Ebby might be considering a dive angle. Flawless was there to back it up, but he hadn't reset yet. Steel was sitting on that extra call field, now does get to back, picks up the Sorcerer's Boots full out, but we do have some fighting bot lane. Yeah, but not too much fighting as Yutbon actually with a level yield onto Yuhi, and giving as good as he gets in these early trades, and... Whilst this on, on the surface may not look too bad for DFM or uh, too bad for Burning Call, rather, this Draven needs to be getting leads in the early game and emphatically isn't doing that. Yeah, it is building up those adoration stacks, so we'll have to see when the opportunity to cash in does arrive. Could wait until one of these objective fights. Does have the uh, newer element of the ultimate as well, that passive execute that scales with the adoration stacks. So it, it's not as punishing now for Dravens to not begin to snowball, you know, from that level three mark that we typically want to see them uh, begin to rack up those kills. But you definitely don't want to be getting to like the 10, 15 minute mark without getting some gold. Flawless now looking for an aggressive invade angle. This is just what he does. Yeah. It's once again and... trading in the mid line. I don't think we've actually seen a flawless duet land onto Yaharong. Dice has been very swift at getting those out, but th this Arya is finally going to get oh. caught by one. And <laughs> <laughs> this is the caster, caster curse coming through, middle cut. Of course, man. Of course, man. Flawless I'm now, a little bit uh, more... pretty deep in the enemy jungle, maybe looking for. A small dive onto Yaharong. The flash ultimate coming through from Dice. Immediately responded oh. to with a flash charm from Yaharong, but <laughs> now I have to do a little bit of a loop around as in the bot lane. Still was looking to make his presence known, but with uh, Flawless roaming over, level six access to those chains on the Morgana is going to be using them already onto the DFM jungler. Stun secured into the root, into the damage as well. And this is what we were talking about. The Morgana can chunk you as long as she can make you stand still. Yeah, did tick over to level 6 there, did steal with a little bit of soaked XP from the wave. Not going to look for any sort of a play here, though, onto the level 5 members of the opposing bot lane. Just going to let this wave continue to push, reset. And the neutral objective priority hasn't been super high. Rift Herald now on the map. We see Ebby getting some deep vision, maybe trying to take away this red buff himself here. Tricky little Ebby on this dino going to go and pick up the opposing buff. It's a nice bit of aggressive play here from DFM. And, and we're seeing I, I, what I feel like is maybe a little bit of a switch up because DFM have been the early game team in, in the LGL. They play incredibly aggressive. Um, uh, sometimes they'll force plays that maybe they don't need to. As uh, Ray Farky, uh, going to drop a recall here. Steel and Ebby the on their music. way over. Mission Impossible. Oh, no, they found him. <laughs> oh, no. Uh... Oh, no. The boar is about to get roasted. There is nowhere for Ray Farky to go. A second kill of the game. This one claimed for Ebby. Yeah, and that was just a really nice bit of vision and information wrangling coming through from DFM. They had just seen Flawless down on the bot side of the map, knows he wants to continue his clear. So Steel has the angle to come up top, and Ebby, knowing that that top side jungle was open, moved to the red buff first, set up the flank angle. Ray Farky sort of sniffed out it was coming, saw Steel starting to come up the river, but just didn't have enough time to get that back off, and that'll be parlayed into the Herald take, but this fight... Not going to be going completely uncontested. Burning Core are here, but Ebby about to hit Mega once again could come and back this up. Yeah, I, I think that DFM just have the numbers advantage a little bit quicker than uh, Burning Core have been able to generate. The uh, yeah. Glacial Fish are thrown out there just for a little bit of disengages. It's actually Ebby picking up this uh, Rift Herald, so really going to be indexing into this now. 
Yeah, and it's sort of a feels-bad situation for Ray Farkey because this is a top laner's lot in life, right? Was baited with the idea that, oh, maybe I get to play the Aurelia. Uh, you know, I get to get the counter pick, and he's going to pick Nar into me, and I get to body him. And then it's like, well, now the way it works out, we Ooh. want you to play the Sedge. But speaking of the Aurelia, that is just one yeah. dead dice. Yeah. yeah, it's a load of damage. The Black Shield coming through, but it is not enough to keep him alive. Flores is going to claim Burning Kill's first kill of the game as Utabon is starting to roam over, takes out Loser oh. with the Ultra oh. Laser and flashes forward onto the Morgana. DFM, they're the early game team. Yeah, that was crazy coming through from Utapon, flashing over the Dark Binding there, showing up in the nick of time like a rider on horseback. Over that wall comes and completely turns the tempo of that fight. Burning Core going to pick up one, but in the end, Detonation focused me saying, you can pick all the crazy explosive early game picks you want. We're still going to make it work here in the early as we get another look. And it's DICE just with a little bit of that Aurelia Syndrome, Ebby immediately punishing. You queued just a little bit too far forward, the Flawless Duet finds no stun. Yaharong with the charm. Then in the end, that blade search is not going to mean very much whatsoever. Loser trying to find the CC chain. Yaharong will fall in the end to the chains, but at that point, Utapon already on their way. Going to get that extendo beam out. Flash the dark binding right in on Flawless's face. Set up for Abby, who is absolutely popping off on this Nar. And now... It looks really rough for Burning Core because this bot lane needed to get ahead. It needed to be ahead of the Zeri to, to get it work. And yeah, you, he's got to his Mythic first, but you're 15 CS down. That's a couple waves. And Utapon has two kills. So in terms of gold, these AD carries really aren't on parity. If you, he can get a decent shutdown and claim those Adoration stacks in the next few minutes, maybe this uh, gold advantage that DFM have built for themselves get shrunk a little bit, but we're already starting to see what we talked about, DFM getting advantages in the early stages and Burning Core not quite able to keep up. Yeah, and critically, that call just got finished and sold away for Utapon, very much on the clock in terms of the CS score, coming out a little bit ahead of Yuhi, so does have that mythic for himself now, ahead of what could be a first Drake fight, be able to last a whole while longer, but that hook just not going to find its mark. And it's interesting that we're talking about the Drakers. Yuhi may have overstepped on the pot lane here. Ooh. Ooh, that was uh, that was bloody close. But uh, DFM, I hold that thought, as uh, they might be looking for a gank here on to lose when Yuhi. No, 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 nothing's going to happen. But we said that the way that Burnick will win this game is they make it a little bit crazy in the early game. They really go toe-to-toe -to -toe with DFM, and they prevent them from sort of playing out their game plan. The fact that there has been so little focus on Drakes when Burnick will have had these higher base numbers in the bot lane I think makes a lot of sense from DFM. You don't want to be going towards that objective. You don't want to be precipitating these fights when you think they may go badly for you. 3v3 in the bot lane, but loser is already dead. DFM yeah. not going to claim any more from that kill, but it is another pickup for the first place team as Yuhi forced to flash away. That is just an absolute tragedy coming out for Burning Core there. Loser does not have the tankiness here on this Glacial Augment version of the Nautilus and found what looked like an okay engage angle, but the follow-up just was not there. Now Ray Farkey will be the next to fall. No, does skirt past, gets the ultimate out. See if the chase down continues. Looks like he will be able to get under this tier two and away to safety, but more fighting. Yeah, as Loser has roamed up here and is getting a catch onto Ebby, the charm is going to land onto Dice, but no further engagements from either side. And DFM, after securing that positive play in the bot lane, are finally going to take a Drake. Yeah, and it just speaks to the lead detonation focus. We have built up for themselves here, holding three members just with their soul laners up near that red buff as now Ebby even gets that consolation prize on the exit. Meanwhile, they go and take out that Drake, just controlling both sides of the map at once under no real threat from Burning Core here. And this is that 15 minute mark we were talking about earlier, Middle Cot, where if you get to this point and the Draven hasn't done anything yet, it's really going to be rough. We will just get a little replay here of how this kill came through onto Ooh. Loser. Now, Flawless is here, so Loser's thinking to himself, okay, we have the Morgana, we have the Big Burst coming out, we can find the CC chain, but when you CC the opposing Braum first, when that's what the target your yeah. hook finds is, it's not really going to be a fruitful endeavor for you. It just lasts right through it. The clone eating a lot of the damage there, and then they can just continue with an aggressive play to force the flash out of Yuhi, but yeah. now Ray Farky trying to defend this turret. Uh, yeah, no, you're going to need to run away uh, at some point. Actually able to clear that wave down decently. But I love that you highlighted that flash at the end because that's kind of Harp's thing. He's been the support in the LGL that has always been willing to 
push a little bit further and gain that extra advantage. That flash on the Braum, a hell of a lot less valuable than a flash on a Draven. And if Yaharong can start hitting some of these charms, then they're able to punish that. I don't think Loser wanted to hit that hook at all. That nope. would have been a, a certified <laughs> hilly hook if that had connected. So thankfully that one doesn't go through, but the mid lane tier one cleared up and now Abby just continuing to be such a oh, nuisance no. in Ray Farby's There's nothing face. you can do. Oh, the flash away, oh. the hyper prox goes mega right at the end to celebrate a solo kill. And DFM, they're gonna get an engage in the mid lane as well. 3v2, and there is nothing that Yuhi or Loser could do. Double for steel. Yeah, wrap it up. Send it home here, middle cut. I mean, that should just be all she wrote. All those adoration stacks going down the toilet. Pfft, there for Yuhi. It's essentially your last win condition in this game. Uh, left out to dry. Flawless really not finding the impact in these fights that you would hope for with this very Ooh. aggressive Morgana build. But now Dice looking for the dive. Dive onto Yaharong, but the charm has already come out. The Aurelia has a lot of damage. Flash away trade! One for one in the bot lane. Yeah, and typically you don't mind going one for one when you're this far behind because at least it's some sort of consolation, but it just feels like Detonation Focus me going to do so much with the gold that is granted now to this R as we get a nice little replay here yeah. on the top lane. And this is just Ray Farkey, uh living the lot of a uh, weak side top laner who was assigned to Sejuani. Ebby's so fat. He has the red buff, the slows coming out, the hyper proc means the chase down the fancy feet for days to dodge out on that W and Ooh. then the nice reaction action flash past the glacial prison just finds everything he needs under turret there absolutely styling off on one of his signature picks and then we see in the mid lane you he a loser almost doing a similar thing just stepping a little bit too far forward dfm waiting in the wings and punishing them appropriately as yo oh. finally goes down adoration stacks cashed in for you he not as much gold as he would have liked but at least it's something burning core still gonna be on the wrong though the black shield how to buy enough time as Yahong dips over the wall and gets onto the back line. There is nowhere for the Draven to go except into the fountain. A double kill already secured for Ebi as Ray Farky actually gets a stun onto Rob and he's able to trade one back. But now the Sejuani is on oh, the, the run place. and has absolutely nowhere to go. Another fight for DFM. Yeah, started off looking all right for Burning Core there, but it's just that game of inches. Yaharong's positioning absolutely sick, taking that Spirit Rush over the wall to find a nice charm angle, as we will see it one more time here. Starting with what began this whole play, right? We snapped back to live, and we weren't quite sure how that kill began. It's Flawless still looking for this aggressive uh, move into the enemy jungle, despite the disadvantage they are at. And just a nice dark binding to find Utapon there, and the CC follow-up is so huge and that is just what you need when it comes to getting down this area it's that point and click cc it's Botland. a depth charge finally oh, the execute coming in but picture they're going on to yeah. every 1v3 the nar can't win those a shutdown for dice the cast couple of minutes burning core have made some very strong proactive plays but dfm are always ready to respond you to firing onto that mid lane tower yeah, critically, haven't cut this gold lead all that much. Still about that five and a half, six k mark, pretty consistently. But it's nice to see Burning Core here not laying down and dying. And they do have a little bit of a flank angle coming through. Maybe they can pinch Yuta Pond, but if he has that E up, it's going to be very hard. And the thing is, we're talking about Burning Core not laying down and dying, but I feel like these are the sort of plays that they should have been making 10, 15 minutes ago. Like you've got uh, this dragon, you've that. got this Nautilus, you've got the Volgada. If you can land some CC onto Yuta Pond who isn't running cleanse, by the way. You do just kill him, but we never really saw that come to fruition until it was a little bit too late. Yeah, as I think the observers have learned their lesson here, giving us the replay in the picture in picture uh, because live has been so explosive so far. And you just see that's a constant, uh, or rather a consistent, uh, timeless gank squad play coming out from the side of Burning Core. You bring three people to a one-man fight and you're going to win that one handily, but doesn't shut down how huge Ebby still is. Six, one, and two. Uh, Trinity Force plus Black Cleaver sitting handily in the inventory going to mean so much dps and many so much tankiness in mega i mean you just really have to play around this nar because he will mess you up either way yeah, i was uh, in the bot lane we are seeing steel summon that uh, second rift elders dice is taken to 40 percent hp for what just feels like incidental damage dfm don't have to commit too strongly to take this irelia low and now the dive potential that can come out from that champion basically non-existent as this tier two falls in the bot lane. The last tier two available for Burning Core is in that top side. And 
No one can really match against Ebi, so I think that's going to be falling fairly soon. Yeah, it's more and more map control being ceded over to Detonation Focus Me here. We take a look at all of the deep vision, all of these tier twos, except that lone one in the top lane now down means they just have complete control to continue moving forward at all times, find whatever fights suit them. And it, it really feels bad for Burning Core here because you're playing this composition that wants to find creative flank angles, right? You want to find dark bindings from darkness, and that just gets harder and harder the more control DFM has. This isn't really a comeback comp. Yeah, well, you, you've got the tools, but I think it, that one of the things about competitive play is when teams are putting this vision forward, it is so hard to actually use those tools. As you sort of see this, this bot side like you were alluding to, it's basically lit up like a Christmas tree in favor of DFM and with two items now coming through for YouTube on two items for Yahuang, two items for Ebi as well. These these carries are really, really starting to spike and whilst that itemization is coming through for Burning Crew as well, maybe presenting opportunities that they can fight. As soon as DFM go back to base, they're picking up third items very, very quickly. Yeah, and that is just in time for this Baron, although we see something getting started off here. Yeah, engaging onto the Braum is not usually a good idea, as that means that Steel could go in with the Cyclone, as so much damage comes out from Utebon. It's actually the Draven who's going to be falling first, and now DFM could split up the fight. Yaharong falls down for only the fourth time. He's split his dice, starting to take over the rest of the play. Utebon solo, the Ignite, the Snipe on the Binding, and Burning Core are finding the fight. Steel still alive as Ebi is diving nice forward on to lose a low HP means that Burning Core have to retreat. It looked good at the outset of the play, but you cannot deny the power of DFM. Yeah, that's Ebi going to style to finish off the ace there, to finish off the fight. Not quite enough members left to take this Baron, but that should be at least a top lane tier two going over to this Gnar, who will absolutely shred it through Ebi with his pop-off moment and just absolutely playing that fight through to the last very, very well. I mean, Burning Core, they're down 9k now. Uh, this gold lead starting to get to a, a point that we couldn't even fathom before as they Ooh. made their last ditch effort get into the replay and we see how it does all go down they think it's harp who is overstepped they think it's the you know play coming through for themselves but unipon just having so much influence with that extendo beam over the wall does get out of dodge with that depth charge as well can just take the dash over the wall opens up room for yaharong to come in and get the cc down in the back line will fall but dice trying to turn it around here with a nice blade surge into the back line but in the end the gold lead just a little bit too advantageous for dfm ebby in particular really popping off to save this fight getting so much damage down at every possible angle flawless got to live for a little while longer because of a nice black shield but we're right back to live because baron is up and started yeah but it's going to be turned away from as the fight has already begun hookling land onto that brawn but the damage not being dealt enough and it's actually a huge ultimate coming through from Emmy. but the nar falling down at the start of the play huge bond though full hp able to free hit that flawless duet buying a little bit more time for burning core as they are going to lose their top laner top for top trade as burning core are the team in the retreat but dfm willing to chase further forward no black shield available for flawless and that dark finding not quite landing or oh, actually secures it onto Utes Bomb, but it's still going to be able to dash away burning core on the retreat burning core trying to get away and do just manage it and the end it's a one for one it's top laner traded for top laner Utapon keeping that ultimate going those stacks up for so long in that fight dfm really wanting to keep it going but once that cyclone is out you don't really have a proactive engage button with the nar dead and that is one place where the detonation focus me comp does suffer as opposed to the likes of a nautilus hook or a glacial prison coming out from ray farkey so we're going to do it all again in a few minutes here whether it as uh, is that this hextech drake which will be hitting the rift in just 10 seconds or at the Baron, and it looks like Burning Core really want to cut off this Drake stacking. They might just make their stand at this Hextech Dragon. Yeah, they're 9,000 gold down. We've seen how close the fights can be. Harp, once again, going to be the initial target as the hook goes wide. DFM still going in, going out, shaking it all about as now. Burning Core are a little bit split. Yuhi isolated on the side, slammed into the wall, and taken out as Ray Farkey is going to be chased down as well. Good flawless duet buys a millisecond of time, but it's already two dead for Burning Core. It's going to be three dead for Burning Core. It's going to be four dead for Burning Core, and DFM take the fight. They're going to take the Baron as well. Man, oh man. Middle cut. 
when I came into the league, we would sigh when these players would pick up NAR because it just wasn't in the meta. It didn't have uh, an impact. It felt like a, a lazy sort of default onto comfort. But Abby showcasing why this champion is so impactful, especially in the hands of a master like himself. That NAR, which horribly named Ultimate, by the way, yeah. <laughs> at least for a caster's perspective, uh, just sounds like you're shouting the champion's name over and over again. But... Oh. Yeah. Oh, oh, that was actually pretty close coming through. But once again, Evie with the NAR just uh, completely taken over and crushing Burning Core's dreams there. But in that last fight around the Drake, finds the way to sort of curve the bullet, find the angle to yeah. hit two into the wall. We'll get a replay on it right here. I mean, just such exciting stuff when is in Evie's hands and, and maybe nobody else's. But you know what? That's fine yeah. by me. Give me Evie NAR all day long. Absolutely, mate. And, and I like that Burning Core were trying to make the play. Uh, onto this Drake trying to get in first, but the issue is look how split they become. You've got three people on the top side of this fight, you've got two people on the bottom side, and that means that there's no one who can really defend Yuhi. You get the Nar, you get the ultimate, and you can just chase them down. That's what this DFM composition is so good at doing, continually applying the concussive blows, dashing over walls, finding these picks, and even when DICE is diving in, fighting huge ultimates, you're not relevant enough on the Irelia to be making these plays. No, absolutely not. And at this point, it gets even more difficult for Burning Court to mount a defense. Easy for TFM to play on multiple lanes here. Abby just going to be a uh, tower turret taking machine. Uh, Dice trying to find something on the backside here in bot lane, just trying to get one of these objective bounties, but does create a numbers disadvantage. We're going to see the concussive blows tag up Ray Farky as here comes Yahrong moving forward. Everfrost into the damage as Ebby once again diving forward. No kills for Burning Core yet secured in this fight, but HB bars very, very low. That top lane in him falling down still a minute and a half on this Baron. That means that there is absolutely no reason to stop pushing if you are DFM. Yeah, I mean, there's no real wave clear on the side of Burning Core. They're looking great for Farky. something. Loser going to find the hook. There, but he wasn't quite able to find it as Dice is going to be diving in once again as in goes the Wukong. Steel has been having an impervious performance this game and he may just lead his team to victory. The Wukong finally going to get shut down as Yuhi forced to flash away but doesn't have enough time to get out of there. Loser falling as well. It's just DFM, baby. So, so clean in the final fight and going to claim victory. Uh, that they are basically in control all along. Burning Core had some some little get back moments, but nothing uh, that led you to believe conclusively they were ever really in a commanding position in this game. As that will be DFM going up to thirteen and one. I do believe they lock Juggernaut match with two more Ws here in the regular season, so they are getting close to uh, where they want to be for sure. Burning Core, meanwhile, not quite a. Uh, able to hold on to that steady sixth place position they want. And I think the thing for me is we came into Champions League, we were like, Burning Core, they need to do something creative. You need to do something crazy. And they did. They pull out the Morgana jungle. We got the Irelia in the mid lane. There's stuff there that they can play around the Draven as well. But it was so passive for the first sort of 15 minutes. And DFM were able to accrue these advantages, able to accrue the natural laning advantages that they just tend to do because of how good they are as players. And it never really felt like Burning Core were on the front foot in this game, which you need no. to be when you are playing with the Draven. Yeah, uh, if some of those fights that came through in the mid games, some of those picks in the side lane had occurred a little bit earlier, maybe it would have been a different story. Uh, but unfortunately, Burning Core failing to ignite there in game number one, DFM doing more of what they do. But I do believe we will have a desk uh, <laughs> this time around, not just the two of us once again. So we'll throw it to a little break here so we can get that set up. We'll be right back to break down game number one on the day.
All right, everybody, welcome back to the desk here after game number one on the day. DFM taking care of business, dispatching Burning Core in pretty dominant and convincing fashion, I would say. We are now joined by the ever lovely masked swan coming on in. Uh, we have our desk fully assembled, all the pieces of Exodia together once again. So let's get into breaking down that game. Swan, it kind of felt like Burning Core just uh, couldn't really get off the ground. They couldn't find their launching point in that game. Mm. <laughs> well, well, I mean, yeah. I mean to sort of c continue the launch pad analogy. Th that that champion sled was a launch pad, but unfortunately, the, the rocket did sort of fall over and then just travel along the ground for like a, a few hundred meters and then explode. <laughs> <laughs> it fell over and hit someone in the head like oh <laughs> yeah yeah a middle school science experiment gone wrong here for burning core with a very creative draft like we, we do have to shout that out Swan. it's a great point uh they did show a lot of creativity and flexibility in draft and they didn't it was so frustrating as Middlecott, you did point out during the game, because there were points where they went aggressive and tried to fight, just they didn't start when they should have. Yeah, yeah, like, they were, there was some very, very relevant fights. There were a number of, like, uh, like one for ones. There was, like, fights that went four for three in DFM's favor that Burning Call could have won. And it, and it felt so strange that this composition, which had very, very clear tools to make things work in the early game, wasn't piloted in that scenario. They kind of waited for the little 15, 20 minute mark. And by that point, DFM on a more scaling composition had already sort of reached the point where they were at parity or maybe even slightly ahead. And from that point, Burning Core never really felt like they had a route back into this game. No, and Swan, something that I thought was so big from Ebby was not just the team fight play that we saw with the NAR, which was exceptional, but was. You, you already commented on this. Uh, Flawless, as we know, likes to go into the enemy jungle. And especially on the Morgana, it's very easy to steal camps away. And when your jungler is preoccupied trying to defend his camps, Ebby had no issue walking up and taking red buffs and whatnot. Uh, yeah. It just really goes to show what he can bring to a team just outside of the mechanical play. It really does. But on that flawless point, though, the allure of a Morgana is because you clear your jungle and then you have a full minute to do anything on the map. Counter, jungle, gank. You can you can literally full clear on Morgana and then go gank top, gank mid, gank bot, and then start your clear again. It's actually insane how fast this champion It's very similar to another champion that somebody else on this deck desk does enjoy playing who has similar ganking paths. And it's it's crazy. Maybe we'll see oh, dear. it We'll find I out. I figured it out. Oh. Figured it out. Figured it out. It's um, He's put the pieces together. So it's kind of like as I disappear into the void. Um, this incredible um, confusion because yeah, Ebby was able to just path correctly. Was able to engage, invade because they got that. So much pressure was thrown top top side so early on. Ray Farky couldn't do anything in this game, and I mean. I wish he was on that Aurelia, honestly speaking. Put throw the Sejuani mid. Let's just let that, that, that happen. <laughs> yeah, I'd be curious what uh, Nymera's thoughts are on the Ari versus Aurelia <laughs> matchup because you pick the Aurelia and then they pick Nar. That feels like the best case scenario. You were daring them. It's almost like Ray Farkey was afraid to have counter pick and lose. So said, now I'm going to self counter pick so that when we lose, it doesn't look as bad for me. That That's almost the vibe I got. But uh, I do, I'm not entirely sure because it did take us a little while to get the desk put together. Um, how much time we have ahead of draft for game two. So any closing thoughts on game one so we can start to sort of expound upon uh, game number two coming up here? Uh, I think for me, game one, um, this is really the, the point for me where we're starting to look at DFM as maybe not just an early game team, but a team that just plays properly. We had this conversation uh, a few weeks back about the stylistic differences between DFM and Sengoku. We said that Sengoku were a team that likes to go a little bit later and the DFM's play style was more early game focused. I'm kind of at the mind now that you actually just need to play early game um, and you need to play more aggressive in the early stages of the game. And relying on scaling, waiting for the game to get a little bit later is is a fallacy, and it's going to make you lose on multiple occasions. 
I think that's a, a golden way of putting it here for DFM. They don't just play the early well, they do everything well. So you got to contest them at every point. Swan, anything on you? Or shall we move on to can't guarantee anything versus Fukuoka SoftBank Hawks Gaming, which nailed it that time. Let's go. <laughs> um, I mean, this game was over at le two minutes in when Flawless, uh, well, no, not when Flawless, when uh, Loser um, got caught out in position on that Nautilus, and they got that very early power spike with the Braum and the Zeri, and then I'll be honest, I was like, oh, Udipon's going to carry this game. The fact yeah. that Ebi ended up being the carry that game kind of just paints the scene that it was, um, it was always going to be over. It's just it could have gone faster, could have gone slower. We got the game it was, and it was a DFMW, as we all predicted. Indeed, indeed. DFMW in game number one on the day, but now it is time to move ahead, look into the future on game number two, put those predicting hats back on, and see what we can suss out about this matchup. And to, to open up the floor wait, 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 here, whoa, whoa, whoa. I think. Dodge, shouldn't we have a small commercial break before we get ready? For I wasn't game sure two? how much time we had i'm oh. not going to lie uh, if, if we if it's time for a break we'll do a small break uh, uh I, you are my boss you sign the, the paychecks so uh that don't exist but you know what that's fine Imaginary. we will throw it esports we will esports. we will throw it to a short break here ahead of game number two and then we'll break down how cga are gonna bungle it